Good afternoon, Eva, and I'd like to introduce the artists. Um, so um, the first artist is um, uh, Hannah Uzo, and the second artist is um, Glory Sanjali. It's very So it gives me great pleasure to be a part of an event that's celebrating black art, or sorry, work of black artists in this way. Myself being an artist, this is the struggle that I have endured for the last 30 odd years since I've worked in the UK, trying to insist and trying to affirm my place within the black art history or the history of black people in Britain making art. Of course, Britain blackened my art because at the time when I started my career, my art was considered to be black art which hitherto, when I trained in Nigeria, it wasn't. So that's one of the dilemmas or one of the sh things I've had to challenge as an artist. Mm -hmm. But here we have very wonderful paintings. Um, in this exhibition, painting our past, the African diaspora in England. So the experience of each painted subject acknowledges their part in British history, which is not only the story of slavery. Of course, um, it is usual when we talk about slavery, the talk is often about the abolitionist story. So not enough is told about slavery. In fact, not enough is told about the fact that black people existed in England before the slavery era. And the challenge is that people who subsequently, you know, after slavery, they, they experienced are not correctly docu you know, documented properly as part of British history. So, um, so I'll read them. The paintings commission, these paintings were commissioned by English Heritage and were painted in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter, following the public protests in reaction to the murder in Minnesota, USA, of George Floyd by policeman, police officer Derek Chauvin. So the cultural significance of the protests was clearly evident in the disaffection by black people and several white people as well, you know, regarding the pro, you know, proliferation in our public spaces of um, busts and portraits and paintings and sculptures celebrating um, colonial despots, um, uh, slavery barons, and um, others with very little mention or um, sort of focus thematically on black people who have lived here for, you know, yonks. So, the R, the R in the title of the exhibition, Painting Our Past, is definitely a step in the right direction of a lengthy struggle for recognition and inclusion by cultural producers and activists such as myself as a practicing British artist, which I hope will endure. So welcome, Hannah and Glory. And I'd like to start by you give us, tell us a little brief about yourself, your background, please. So my name is um, Hannah Uzo. I was born in Zambia um, in, the early, uh, in the early 80s. Uh, a couple of years when I was still a toddler, we came um, to England, but then subsequently moved back. And um, so my life has had this duality, it's always had this duality and this interest in history has always very much been sort of there because my father was diasporic, lived in England, but then subsequently I later came back, you know, um, to be the sort of black in the black diaspora. And I'm married to a Nigerian, so that's, you know, adds another layer of diaspora into the whole mix. And at the moment, um, I sort of had a, I've always been interested in art, but I had a career change, so to speak, and got back into art, you could say, formally about six or seven years ago. And yeah, I'm currently in, in at the Slade uh, doing a master's in painting. Wonderful, excellent. And Glory, could you sort of tell us um, uh, yes, so, a bit of yourself? Yes, yeah, so I was born here in London. My dad is from Sierra Leone and my mom's from Jamaica. So every time people ask me, where are you from? I'm like, it's very hard to answer because um, so the easiest answer, I would just say, yeah, London. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I've always been passionate about art since I was young um, and I've never really found a way to incorporate with, incorporate it with the um, passion I have for history as well and the learning about um, like hidden figures in art history that we'd never ever learn about in school mm -hmm. um, and it's just um, an honour to be here. This is the first panel talk I've done so um, yeah. Excuse me if I'm nervous. Oh no, you're perfectly fine. But yeah, um, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, wonderful. And um, the, when we had a chat a few days ago, 
you described yourself as a social justice warrior. <laughs> oh, no, I'm the opposite. I'm not a social justice warrior. Oh, you're not. I beg your pardon. No, no. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So sorry. <laughs> the only um, social justice warrior I'll be is against um, some of, like, uh, is controversial, but against BLM. I don't believe in BLM. And against some of the things that kind of portray black people in the victimhood light. See. Right, that's very interesting. And your painting um, on Sarah Forbes' um, Bonetta um, almost sounds like your own personal history, your own personal experience of coming to being born in the U or coming to the UK, coming to and the then UK. going back and, and coming, back. coming back, just in the same way <laughs> Sarah Forbes' Bonetta came mm -hmm. uh, after she was um, bought, yeah, and then she um, went to came to the England. She was gifted to Queen Victoria, and then went back because she had a cough. Yes. Why did she have to go back because of the cough? I think um, so. It's the Sarah Forbes story is pretty is pretty interesting in terms of looking at how uh, the political situation in England at the time. I mean, um, I think it was a couple of year, a couple of centuries since the abolition of, of the slave trade in eighteen thirty three, yeah. and so she's caught up. I mean, this is like twenty years later when she's sort of gifted and comes over, um, and there was still a lot of disinformation about black people you know and so when she, obviously she, she's gifted quote unquote you know there's been a lot of debate regarding that exchange yeah. um but when she moves over here and um she starts to i mean i'm just fast forwarding sure, sure. when she starts to feel and well the 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 thinking is that she needs to go back to a better climate that is most suited to her in terms of the weather okay. and so that was sort of like the, I think in letters to the queen, they're more thinking it would do her good if oh, she went back to a better climate because the likes of her are not suited to the English, you know, the English climate, good which of, obviously we, we do know that's, um, was just sort of the thinking in those days. I mean, there may be more um, information around that in terms of, you know, the political nature, but what we do know from the archive was that in terms of the exchange we see from the letters mm -hmm. is that it was more, in order to make sure she's healthier, oh, yeah. let's get her to a better climate. I mean, and I think Sri Lanka was chosen because uh, of the she went there to learn as well. So they wanted a place where she could continue the learning that she had res that she began mm -hmm. here um, in England. Yeah, the uh, name Omoba is a Yoruba name, and Omoba means that she's of royal birth. That's what that means. So her village, um, Oke Odan, was attacked by the Homians. And then they took her, you know, captured her after they killed her parents, and then took her into captivity, whereupon she was gifted, and this is after slavery. Mm. So um, I'm just kind of, I, I question how that gift of a human being would have been accepted after slavery. But of course, I know that many other black people, well after slavery, were taken from their villages and brought to Europe and America um, for exhibitions and for other things, or for some maybe curiosities, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, that were nice to have. I mean, there was slavery in England if you, only a few years before. Um, so, but that ornamental black person who is well adorned, dressed up with all the jewelry and all the trimmings, was a status symbol for the upper classes. Could this have perhaps been the reason why she was gifted to Queen Elizabeth? Or Queen Victoria? Um, I think from, from Captain Forbes, who was um, the one who first encountered Sarah from his diaries, we are told that he goes into the village. First of all, he's on, he's on a diplomatic mission. He's been sent by the queen to negotiate the ending of the slave trade in his region. And so he, that's, his, that's his duty. And in the midst of this encounter, this exchange, obviously King Gezo is, 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 is not going to bend, bend for him. But um, he sees you know, this little child that it presumably is just about to be sacrificed as part of a ceremony. And okay. so he negotiates sort of this, um, this child's so life. He was saving her. So in a sense, he was saving her from this supposedly um, sacrifice because according to what we've been told from the history books is that they only preserved those who, you know, like you said, she was from royal blood, mm -hmm. you know, for special things. And maybe sure. one of those things would have been, you know, a, a human yeah. sacrifice was a part of yeah. some of, yeah. you know, Things that happen the, in the courts. One of then. the justifications for taking us into slavery was that we were being saved from being eaten by our <laughs> kinsmen. <laughs> and we were being saved by being taken into Christendom to be mm. baptized so we would be saved 
when we die, but we have to, of course, pay the price for that saving by giving the labor. Yeah. You know, there's, there is a, there's, there's a so lot to unpack. There's a lot to, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. But the, the reason why we find Captain Forbes with his child is that he's done that sort of negotiation and quote unquote, as he said, saved her from the impending, you mm. know, human sacrifice. And then he, he has this child. And so once he has this child, I mean, obviously there's a, on board uh, the ship, then he, he names her after the boat, the Bonetta, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think she is, you know, like you said, she's gone through this ritual where she's baptized and given a new name. Yeah, whereas with James Chappell, how does a person who has endured that crossing, the, you know, Black Atlantic, how does it come so gentlemanly adorned, you know, and sitting on a, on a beautifully gilt, gilted gold chair and it doesn't look like he's done a day's service in his life, whereas his <laughs> job through his life, all, most of his life, until he um, saved the Hatton family from the fire, yeah. uh, most of his life he was a, 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 a serv in domestic yeah. service. Yeah. So how has it come so adorned? Well, Where has this image come from? Yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity in his past because we, fully don't, we don't fully know much about his life before he was 18. So um, anything could have happened. Maybe he could have maybe come from um, the transatlantic slave trade and maybe was taken from a country. Or, um, you know, some Africans used to come directly from Africa into Britain for the purpose of trading. Uh, or he could have came via Spain where there was already a lot of a big population of um, Africa. If you go back, you know, to the Moors and, um, and things like that, um, when the, they reigned for, I think, uh, for eight, well, they, they reigned uh, from the seventh and the eighth century. That's the Moors, the, the Moors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now that Spain was um, uh, taking back the Spanish in them again, they were yeah. shoving the Moors out there, like, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And so maybe he could have come from there, but it's so ambiguous. We yes. don't really know the story. Mm -hmm. um, all we know is that when he came into the service of the Hattons, he was regarded as a quite an important person in the Hattons as he had the, the master key or, the, or the, the chamber key. And if you look at transcripts, historical transcripts um, that have been preserved and preserved over time, you can see when the Hatt people, the Hattons' friends are talking about him, they're like, um, oh, could you ask um, Sir Black James to open the chambers of John Lewis and this and that? Mm -hmm. Like he, how would he open the chambers of and like chambers like different bedrooms and places in, in the house if you know he wasn't the person who owned the master key? And so he was even before he saved the Hatton family, regarded as quite important. And I painted him in kind of a time period where you know he left the service. It, it's it's. Obvious he left the service of the Hattons because now he was, um, you know, getting married, having a family. He opened a pub, yeah, um, which I didn't get to go to, but I, I did get to see kind of all the place where he lived and served. Um, and it's interesting. Yeah. So you did um, a good amount of research when you were doing making this piece. Yeah, um, and they gave us a lot of research. They had all this research and they had no visual reference. So I was like, how am I going to paint at someone who I don't know who, like what he looks like? There's no, I mean, the only description that I know is that he's a black James. And then I have to go with that. That's very interesting. So did you actually, is this conceived, this image of James, is it conceived from your imagination? I don't paint from my imagination. Okay. I, but what I do oh, you is, had to sit yeah, for it. I see. Yeah. This is pretty much the same way as the image that we now accept has yeah. been the image of Jesus Christ. This is how it came about, <laughs> where, where um, Michelangelo and his brothers you know, came up with a picture yeah. and said, okay, this must be Christ then, so we all accept. What I can say is, um, you know, I've been referenced just with the time frame, the time period. I did have a lot of these, you know, the cravat, the tailcoat, the waistcoat, the, the, the hand things. Um, those are like the kind of clothes he's wearing as well. Um, is another reference to the time period he lived in. So it was it was kind of helpful for me to have a, um, have him assigned for someone to paint because I already had a lot of um, resources in that time period that I could put together to yeah. kind of create this man. So it, it um, brings to mind for me um, a portrait that um, uh, Tam Joseph did of Jimi Hendrix. I don't know if you know Tam Joseph. 
He did a painting of Jimi Hendrix. But I think the painting was originally done by a Dutch master. He simply swapped the face in the portrait and sort of set, hence Jimi Hendrix was set in this time frame with you know all that sort of costuming and all that. But this definitely looks very grand for a man who was a, a in service. And um, it's um, artistic liberty and license to project us in a different way, in a different representation to I am a man and a brother, the kind of imagery that was um, introduced around about that period, maybe after that period, of course, just before the abolitionist movement um, in, the, in the early um, 18th century by um, the Wedgwood, James Wedgwood image, uh, you know, the kneeling African with his hands up supplicating and chains on his leg, a very popular image for the abolition. So this here presents blackness in a grand, higher, sort of respectable way that it's not all blacks who were enslaved. And even when they were enslaved, that dignity of, of, of being who they are was not lost. Yeah. And that's very important. I, I think, you know, blackness and you know Africans in Europe has always been uh, presented in a respectful way until the slave trade came, because the, if you go far back enough, you can see paintings and you could just see these references of these Africans maybe in like religious paintings, Adoration of the Mahdi, yeah. or you could see, even if we go back to the Tudors, mm -hmm. and times where they would be portrayed as fictional characters, like the king or someone in a noble class. I don't think there was that much of a <coughs> BLM thing going on like in Tudor times. So when, when, when they saw, you know, ooh, that's dark skin, that's an African person, they, they would portray them in such, you know, such a, you know, mystical, like mystical creatures. You're mystical creatures in yeah. um, mm -hmm. historical Europe. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that, was, that was how it was for a long time. But so have these, have these figures been, you know, that black historical figure painting, has that been a part of your practice since you did this commission or was that always a part of your practice? Well, I wasn't painting like <coughs> real figures in history. I was more or less painting, um, it was more like a cosplay kind of thing where we, well not cosplay, but um, I would get models and dress them up in like 18th century clothing and then put contemporary objects in the, the painting and kind of mm -hmm. get this kind of mix. And, and um, Glory, so what's your thoughts on this, um, you know, season of exhibitions and events and art fairs and um, the work that's presented in these places currently? Um, I definitely I agree with Hannah. I think people need to see more of this kind of artwork because it's the psychology um, of black history that I think needs to change because every time we view black history month, like I, I don't even think black history should be a month actually. It should just be in history, like full point. Like when we when we when we separate um, black history, it's like we're always gonna have this thing to return to every every year that makes us, us seem, you know, like we're, we're out of place. If we could just make black history British history and stop having a month of this and a month of that and a month to go back to this, it will kind of change the psychology of the way um, kids think um, of, you know, black history. Like, oh, we need to have a month of black history because, you know, black people were oppressed in, in this country. We, we really don't know history that much to, to go back, you know, the psychology is as soon as you get into education, you learn about roots and you learn about transatlantic slavery and plantation. And you learn about King Henry VIII and then Queen Victoria. And then, and then, and then so, so the history is what most people remember is, okay, so, so we learn about all these figures and then, um, and then the black people were slaves, and then now we need to remember, you know, um, that uh, the black people deserve reparations, and the black people are victims in society because of racism. And this narrative just keeps on perpetuating, and I think people are just tired of it. Well, I'm tired of it. <laughs> well, I mean, I see where you're coming from, but um, the other day we spoke about the portrait of, or the portrait attributed to being the portrait of Olauda Equiano. Yeah. And I mentioned to you that I was on a um, Facebook, um, somebody posted on Facebook about Otobaku Guano and put this portrait and I said, no, that's Olaude Aquino. And many other people said, oh no, that's Olaude Aquino. And yeah. then someone said, oh no, it's Otobaku Guano. And then, yeah, 
Yeah, people don't really... Just a confusion. It, it's a con- more confusion because we need more... Um, we need more resources. We need more source of information to actually understand. But nobody will be in such dilemma about the portrait of oh, William yeah, no, no, of course, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. That's, that's true. So, um, maybe there's a, a space for learning black history, not necessarily in one month, but as part of a school curriculum. There, there is a time for everything, but I think we have, um, we have progressed past the time of um, especially, you know, in the time, like I was born in 97, so I don't really know what she was going on before then, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but I think, I think there is a time for everything and um, the time that we're living in now, um, people of my generation need to understand that there is nothing that can stop you except for yourself. You don't need to believe in the, um, you know, the narratives that there's people out there that you know, white supremacy that's trying to suppress you in your way. Because look at already the amount of successful black people. If you just look, take some time to look at how they made it. It was, you know, it was hard work, determination, success. It's the same for any person, whether you're white, black, Asian, British. You just put in the hard work. You just, um, you know, I'm kind of an entrepreneurial as a person. But I, I think that, you know, obviously there have been, um, you know, suppressive systems, suppressive things in the past, but I don't truly believe in um, some of the, the racism narratives that are going around because all my life growing up, I've never been, there hasn't been like a, a, a force of white supremacy that has come and suppressed me in any way. Form. Like I used to be the smartest girl in my class. And I, at some point I was the only black girl in my class. I do remember that. Um, and just growing up, it's it's more like I I don't remember any kind of experiences of being victimized by white supremacy. I have been bullied by other black people. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but it's not. It's at the end of the day, it's um, self experience or your personal experience is not the whole truth. It's we. It's it's better to look at statistics and. Like what's happening when it comes to um, tackling racism? Well, I can say, well, I can only say that you've been born at a great time. <laughs> <laughs> and so thirty years before, I know what happened as an artist, and maybe three hundred years before, he knows what he had to endure as a servant in domestic service. So the fact that you haven't lived that experience is perhaps what has conditioned your current perspective, which is great because we are aiming and aspiring for an inclusive society where we are not described, our first definition is not because we're black, but we're British, yeah. right? An inclusive society, Britain, that is multicolored, right? That is That gives equal opportunities to everybody regardless of their skin. <coughs> so, and that's the society that I see where progressively, so, you know, I mean, I have, I have been in places where I've been like marginalized and maybe, um, you know, growing up, even up until uni, I was like one of like many um, out of uh, a whole class of, you know, just white people, Asians, other people, maybe three and a half black people out of 60 people in the UK. Um, I have been in like places where there's not many, not much representation around, but at, at the end of the day, it's like, when when we make representation our only fight and you know fighting all the powers at the end of the day you, you lose really who you are as an artist some some black artists just want to paint flowers and roses and like not really think about um you know the the political climate and everything but every time we or i have come into a place um like i remember my one of my art teachers in second year is, is isn't there something deeper that you want to speak to in your heart there must be something but they, they're always pushing you to to like go and be a social justice warrior <laughs> that's not like my goal with that. i just want to make art to you know to be beautiful and human okay great and um well this is um very excellent uh, piece that you painted here in terms of it's um Configuration and um, and the colors you've selected and everything. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your, you know, what you feel about color, about light, form, the sort of technical aspects of making a picture? Can you tell us something about your process? I 
I like I tend to look at a lot of historical references where you see I don't know Sir this and Sir that painted in um, you know just the, like a dim lit background where the very earthly colours and had regal kind of you know updressed and everything and I I look at that to to create my own image, but I already have the image in my head before I start painting. Mm -hmm. Some people say, do you, do you make up the image by, from scratch? I mean, kind of, but I don't, um, I don't paint from my imagination. I always have to get the visual references and kind of make it out first before I paint it to actually get, you know, to get the kind of folds with a certain lighting. I, I, I don't believe you can do that from your head unless you like are an amazing painter um, and there's very few people I know who can do that. Well, but, you're an amazing painter. <laughs> <laughs> but like amazing in the sense that they like have visions from God and they could just see every single <laughs> fold with every single light light section. That isn't but, that what every artist gets? <laughs> <laughs> no, because people think that's how we paint. That's it's really not like that. We have to look at visual references a lot to get the art to be some or some of us to be um, the way we want it to be if you're like a photorealistic, if you're a figurative painter. It's not the same if you're like abstract or um, it might be the same. They have a different methodology. Our methodology is we have to, um, you know, look a lot at reference, look a lot of where the lighting is hitting um, certain parts of the face. Mm -hmm. um, because without that, I think I'll, the painting would kind of struggle. But then if you look at the historical methodology of um, historical you know the old masters yeah and um, they would do similar things so for example the scaling up they would you know get like like an old grid to kind of get yeah. the proportions accurate and then sketch out their images before they paint it so they know where the lighting has come from because otherwise i don't think even then they could have done that from the top of their head yeah and then also a lot of impasse to work as well so very heavy paint you know lifting up the surface to define the form you know, so more, much more splendidly, and then also the um, decorative you know work and the, you know, the chair that you sit on and all that takes you know a lot of Refined. care, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's very evident in the painting. Um, who was the uh, who was who was the model in the in the painting? Um, so this person, uh, <laughs> um, I actually I think I met him on Instagram so, and huh? yeah. <laughs> 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 um, as, you know, as a you know, Gen Z artist, I think you know, our methodology is of technology is kind of but um he I actually took him to Clyde Hall. So he did come to see um, you know, where James Chapel was mm. born, everything, right. the information. And he, you know, because at the time when I um needed to paint um James Chapel, I was in desperate need of a model but my first model cancelled and like he was just the person that was like okay i'll do it and he, and he was kind of like quick to act, act and he popped up and i was like okay so this is a guy and then when he came i was like okay so now i'm working with the afro like what am i going to do <laughs> that actually answers the question i asked you when we had uh, earlier uh, discussion yes because i asked you how do you get sentimental about a subject that you don't know and the reason why i asked that was you told me that um, English heritage simply gave you the subject to paint. I took that to mean that they gave you a photograph to paint from. Oh. I didn't realize it was somebody you actually knew, and then there was that building that relationship oh. before you actually executed the work, which makes a huge difference. So there's no question of lacking the sentimental, the oh. emotional connection oh, to the yeah. subject. So I see why that is successful. If it was painting from a photograph, on the other hand, then, I mean, it's no, because there's the, the same. Uh, even if they gave me, there's no visual references of the guy yeah. James Chapel sure. from the past. So if I wouldn't just um, like to get an image, I, I have to get someone bond with someone that can model, and like they have to be the kind of person the right. He was the right fit because he kind of understood the character, the characteristics mm -hmm. of um, um, this kind of man I was trying to create straight away. So it was with 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 other 
portraits, they didn't, I don't think they had to do what I did because they had a few visual references. Yes, I recognized that piece yes. of um, uh, Dido yeah. Bell yeah. from the television character who played <laughs> yeah. the role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then there's the painting was of her as well, so yes. there's even more. Of course. And then, you know, September Severus had a lot of statues and Indeed. you could see him in the bust and, yeah. and the Hadrian's Wall with the, the, all the black figures that were on Hadrian's Wall that we don't know to this day. Mm -hmm. And Sarah Falls Bonetta, who obviously she had photographs of her, which mm -hmm. is like even better. Right? Yeah. And then I'm just here like, no reference, just <laughs> yeah. make up something. And so um, it's, it's okay because it's what I usually do. I usually um, get models. I, I so don't, I'm the character. Of, yeah, and I, I control the lighting, I, I control the, you know, the colour, even the colour of the jacket wasn't the original colour, I did some mm. Photoshop manipulation mm -hmm. to get um, the kind of palette I wanted, so yes. like the deep red against the the, the soft green mm -hmm. um, is the kind of palette I was going for. Yeah, why didn't you go for a pink background? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't you go for a darker skin tone? And then sort of maybe some bright well, it pinks. wouldn't be true to the, the model's um, um, skin tone. I mean, he was actually a little bit lighter than this, actually. He's from Somalia, I think. Interesting. Um, but I I don't want to risk... You don't have to explain <laughs> why you chose your model. It's a hard I was only question. teasing. <laughs> I was only teasing. So, um, well, where, is the work, where does the work hang when it's not at the Africa Centre? So that's a good question because we think English Heritage just keeps it in their collection, like in a um, storage. Oh, really? But, but before, it would have been at Kirby Hall where he was actually um, born. And then Sarah Falls Bonetta would be at the Isle of Wight where she resided. Mm. And so Kirby Hall is still open as maybe National Heritage um, um, Hall? Yeah, it's a site so you can why, look. You would, you would think that this portrait would be there because yeah, that's the connection. I would put to the history. I think it should still be there because of the it. place where, at least I know for my work that they chose a place where it would forever be there. But with the way they change things around, maybe if they're doing a show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, so where does your work hang? At anyway? the Isle of Wight. Um, and then um, Osborne House. Died yes. as well as at Kentwood, where okay. she grew up. All right. So House. the portraits are actually in the locations where mm. the uh, people in the portraits have connections. Yes. Have connections. That's great. So basically, what's next for you in terms of? Um, are you obviously? I know you're painting other um, personalities from of history, and you I are would like to. practice. I'm not exactly, but I would like to because there are still many other African Europeans who have no visual reference, mm -hmm. and I've read about them, and I think I want to give them a, a visual reference, just like James Chapel. Yeah. Okay. Well, I suppose the artistic license to create the image and tag it to a historical person is not a new thing because the portraits of St. John and St. David slaying the dragon and all that, and Satan, in fact, also <laughs> is all from somebody's <laughs> artistic <laughs> imagination. A lot, a lot of religious paintings came from the medieval and the Renaissance, adoration of the Magi, the amount yeah. of times you see like that random black person <laughs> holding like a, yeah. a golden thing. Yeah. Um, it, but yeah, it, most of them were also models, by the way, who yeah, posed the for those yeah, yeah, like, paintings, apart from the Satan one. Possibly, there's some horrible things out there. <laughs> and so, what's uh, what's new? What's next for you? Oh, uh, what's next for me? Obviously, I'm finishing my. My last year in, at Slate, I finished my MA in painting. Mm -hmm. My current research is uh, about the art of Central Africa, the Central Belt of Africa, wow. covering quite a number of countries, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola, because I think there's a, the material culture in that region, I think mm -hmm. um, it, it interwoves with each other and it hasn't been fully explored. Yeah. And I'm trying to tease, that's a part of history I'm sort of trying to tease out. So my research is at the moment based on that and definitely will continue after I graduate. And there's any interest in um, the historical people from Africa's history, significant people in Africa's history, Mansa Musa, um, Sundia Takeita, all those people, um, Shaka de Zulu and all that. Yes. Is that a part of it? No, it, it, as well? it, not necessarily. Um, I think it's, it's more to do with the material culture and I'm, I'm trying to move in 
So Mansa Musa is going up to Mali. Shaka is going south. So I'm trying to I'm trying to make, remain in that region. Obviously, there was a lot of overlap. I mean, that's why then Davele went up north and got into Zambia. Um, the Ngoni people in Zambia are part of that, and there was wars with the Shona. So there's there's an inter in, interaction with these these tribes from the south, as well as uh, the, you've got the Lunda Luba migration that came, you know, from the west of Africa into the cent into the center of, of Africa. Mm -hmm. So this this movement of people and how the you know language and culture and artifacts, the exchange in that middle is what I'm really interested in, sure. uh, because during the imperial era. You find when you talk about the Portuguese ivories, you know they were talk, talking of another culture. And that's even part and of so, British history as well. It's yes, in, in Africa, but it's part of British yeah. history. Exactly. So that, and so I'm looking at that region uh, at the moment in my practice. There's a good book uh, which I was involved with many years ago, maybe about thirty years ago. Um, it's called. It's titled "Reconstructing the Black Image" by Gordon de la Motte. And there's another book I read, which is called "Black Britannia." by Edward Scobie. Those are really good books. So I know the Gordon Dollar Moth uh, book, The Reconstructing Black Image, has a lot of those historical you know, um, individuals from mm. pretty much right across mm. the continent, in fact, the middle of Africa. So, so Fantastic. Yeah, be Thank good you. Great to see. Cheers. Yeah, wonderful. And um, so we continue the um, process of creating this history and in the process of trying to integrate and not sort of divide and identify only as black alone, but as British too. Yeah. And so that work is a um, very um, noble work to continue. And like I say, from a person who's privileged in a period of history where some of us have fought those battles already, and some others do before me. And, and that's a good thing, because if you fought those battles, why do we need to refight the battles? Because we're not <laughs> on, on plantations, we're not really like, like the victims of what's happening today we need to really use the opportunities that the, the past has given us and actually go forth instead of become victims all over again and repeat the fight when the fight is already you know sure i will i take your point yeah thank you both very very much for a very <laughs>